it's very hard for an artist or a band to look at themselves the same way that a fan or a listener, the yeah. audience, because yeah. they're seeing something different. You may you may be the biggest geek in town right here, um, but at the same time, they're not seeing you that way. He's the lead singer of a classic heavy metal band from Philadelphia. They've performed all over the world in the US, UK, and Europe. You may know them from their songs On the Hunt or Sand Sandstorm Salvation. Please welcome Mick Michaels of Corners of Sanctuary to the podcast. How are you doing today? All right, man. How are you? Thanks for having I'm, me on. Yeah, no problem. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, happy to have you on. Happy to have this chat with you. Um, first thing that I ask all my guests, kind of just to get the conversation started, what was your first experience with music like, or what first made you get into wanting to make music? Um. You know, music has kind of been something that's, I know a lot of people will say this, music has been something that's kind of been with me uh, my whole life. Like when I was a little kid, just kind of, there was always music around. My older brother played in a band. My grandfather played in bands. Um, here in Philadelphia, we have the Mummers and string bands. My grandfather was uh, was one of those um, those musicians. So he, so, you know, on uh, New Year's Day, uh, you know, he'd be down marching through the streets you know, playing the banjo or the accordion or something with, with all the string bands. So music was always something that kind of was happening. And I knew early on that I wanted to be in a band. I just didn't know what I wanted to do uh, in that regard. But uh, music just always kind of seemed and I, just something that resonated with me. So, yeah. And, and so like growing up, was it kind of music from the start, would you say? Or was there anything else you thought you might want to do in life? Well, I mean, in the seventies, you know, I mean, once Star Wars came out, I wanted to be a Jedi. But uh, you know, other you know, other than that, you know, I, you know, like with any other little kid, you know, you wanted to be an astronaut. Again, in those days, it was something kind of cool. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't know if I had aspirations to be one particular thing over another. Um, though, you know, growing up, everybody goes through these little segments. I'm sure, you know, that's that's normal. Yeah. Like, interested in this and you're interested like i wanted to be an archaeologist after seeing raiders of the lost ark as a kid and then i realized you had to do a lot of reading and stuff i'm like oh man where's the bull whips and the hat you know it's not the, that that wasn't the case but yeah uh, but music always was something that just i kept going back to and again like i said i mean i remember watching as as a real little kid watching my brother perform uh and i was like man i want to i want to be able to do that so i actually started out in drums and uh kind of kind of went that route first you know so it was cool it's cool yeah and and so was your brother kind of playing the same type of music that you play now this sort of metal the heavy metal genre or was it something else yeah oh yeah and in those like so back then it was like you know black sabbath and and zeppelin and uh early judas priest and stuff like that so you know kiss kiss was definitely one of those early yeah. bands so yeah i mean I, I gravitated i guess i could say that he introduced me to that that style of you know that hard rock um into heavy metal type of sound and it just and again it resonates with me however i you know on a personal note like i do have a liking towards pop music as well like and as a kid and again this is the 70s now um you know listening to the jackson five and and um you know elton john and and you know, bands like that, Rod Stewart, and people that were on the yeah. radio, you know, and in that day and throughout the 80s and all, the radio was their, your primary source until MTV came and then you were glued to the set. Nowadays, which is kind of cool, I mean, music is at your fingertips 24-7, man. You could, yeah. you know, you don't have to wait to see your favorite artist. They're, you know, you just get online and there they are doing something. So, you know, there was a, there was always like music being in, played in the house, uh, in the car, you know, again, like, you know, it was it was just a means of connecting to a greater community yeah and so you kind of mentioned it having so much like access to music at your fingertips having it so accessible that also has kind of introduced a whole new wave of artists musicians bands and it's now there are like you know you'll never know every band in the world because there's always going to be some men you don't know about it's so like oversaturated almost in music 
do you do you think that's sort of good for music that people now have the chance to get their music out there or do you think it's you know kind of lost like uh, overcrowding almost i mean well actually both i mean there for so many years the industry was was reserved for a small group of people and it usually was not the artist it was the execs the people that kind of made the money at the end of the day yeah. and so there was there was barriers there was gatekeepers that you couldn't do certain things i mean in the 80s when i was playing i remember now i'm in philadelphia it could sometimes take up to three months to get a cassette tape to jersey to get a showcase at a at a venue to play now it's just like boom um and then you know you can release your own music today now it's more affordable that you can do your own you can you know record your own stuff and and all this stuff so the technology and that accessibility i think is a plus the downside of it is is now it's so oversaturated because back in the day, not everybody had the means to do stuff. So they didn't necessarily get the chance that other bands did, right? The bands that had some backing or yeah. quickly gained a following were able to kind of pick up speed and, and move forward. And usually a lot of those bands were then signed at some point, you know, like out of Philadelphia, you know, um, in the eighties, you had Cinderella come out and you had Brittany Fox and, Roughhouse and Tangier and a lot of the bands were just picking up and you know but there you know I mean there may have been 20 good bands in the area and out of those 20 you know five or six were really top-notch pros and now it's like there's it's so oversaturated you can easily get lost I mean yeah but at the same time like you were saying there's you'll never know everyone but you'll never run out of music it's yeah. just it's crazy and then with the pandemic over the last couple of years the the amount of music that's coming out i mean just a uh, a few months back i mean spotify was getting a 60,000 new um uploads like you know in a day or something yeah. like craziness yeah yeah that and then also now that we've kind of scaled back that from that and things have kind of opened up now you see all those artists that released all that music over quarantine going live and performing and having tours and whatnot. So now it's like live music is, you know, everywhere. Almost all of your favorite bands are like touring or playing somewhere live now. And you, now it's just the live scene is almost more like open than ever. And there are shows all over. Yeah. You know, again, I mean, I know that the artists on a, on a business and everybody wants to make up for lost time. Right. Yeah. And you can see that because ticket prices are a little higher. The venues are a little bit more expensive with food, parking, you know, merch, you know, all that. And I mean, it's understandable, but at the same time, everybody was affected by it. And that the other, the flip side is, is everybody's been jonesing to get out again. And, you know, both the musician and the fan, they want to, they want to be able to, there's nothing like live, like a live show, right? Yeah. You can, you can watch something on YouTube or on, you know, some streaming thing, which is great. It it really did fill that gap the two over the two years, but there's just nothing like that energy that you're getting from the artist on the stage and the crowd. Yeah. Uh, so you know, th like this summer, you know, with the Motley Crue tour and Def Leppard and all that, I mean, people are just flocking to see it. It's just you yeah. know, uh, me being one of those people, I went to one of those shows. I went to one of the Fenway Park shows for that with the the stadium tour with them, and it was it was awesome. You know, just having the and. That was especially, I mean, it still was a concert, but it felt almost more like a festival setting because they had so many, you know, acts there, so many bands performing and people were, you know, coming and going with food. But it was like awesome to be there, awesome to hear bands that I knew less about or songs that I hadn't really heard of from these bands. And it was definitely an awesome time to just be there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what people are saying. Unfortunately, I, I missed it when it rolled through our area because we were I think we were on the road. Um, but you, you have like like you said, it, it's like this experience, this community experience. It's like a festival. But, you know, but it, it you know, and it's it's just and it's a collection of of individuals that aren't just a bunch of old guys. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's it's like if you if you look at the demographic of the people that are attending the show. I mean, it's it's like from babies to, you know, people in their 60s and 70s and everything in between. And that's that's that power of music. And I also think it's, you know, the excitement that people are they want to get back out. The last two years, it's it's been tough on everybody. I mean, 
you know, yeah. we've been restricted of movement. We couldn't, you know, uh, mingle with, you know, with our groups and stuff. And so I think it's been a real positive. I mean, again, the stats on that tour, they're making millions. You can't beat that. Oh, yeah. So they're doing something right. <laughs> and, um, and so kind of going back to these, you know, new bands, new artists that might be coming out, what kind of advice or tips would you give to bands that want to sort of grow their following, get their name out there, sort of start getting their career to a point where it's really they're picking up speed? Um, I think, well, the, I think the thing that's most important to me that I would try to relay to people is you need to be true to yourself and what it is that you're doing. Because if you're playing just a role or you're kind of going with the bandwagon, that's not long term in terms of maintainable, right? You can't sustain that because it's not true to yourself. And you'll often see that. Well, back at, you'd probably see it more back in the day, but a lot of bands, they would say the first album was for the record company. And then the second album, you start doing, if, if it was a success, you could start doing a little bit more to yourself. Like, I, I mean, case in point, like Cinderella, they came out with what a lot of people would call at the time it maybe glam or or something like that. Though I never really considered them glam besides what they dressed up as. But but each album that came after that became more and more bluesy to the point that Tommy Kiefer today is kind of just playing like, you know, rock and blues uh, rather than what would be classified as heavy metal. And I think that if you're not true to yourself and true to what the type of music that you want to do, is it's not sustainable. Like I could probably write a death metal album, but I don't think I could do it for multiple albums because it's not yeah. in me. Um, I mean, being able to play something is one thing. Like you could have the skills and the chops to do that. And many musicians nowadays definitely have that. But if you're not connected to that music and it's not feeling something for you, then, you know, I, I write music that I want to hear. Yeah. I don't know if everybody else wants to hear it, but it's something that I want to hear. So I know that I can, I, that's sustainable to me. It doesn't have to be likable to everybody because, you know, music, just like anything else, it's, it's subjective, right? And if you worry about that so much, you're going to get lost. And then say you do have a bit of a career. And again, if you're making, if your career is all about money and that type of thing, well, man, more power to you. You can't take that away, right? Success is success and you work hard on it. However, you may have a string of albums, say you have five to 10 albums, and each one is completely different. Like, you know, and nowadays it's, it's not uncommon for artists and bands to kind of almost hop genres, right? Yeah. So there are little, maybe, you know, a lot of bands that were metalcore, then they went to just kind of pop rock. And some of them that have been out for a while go, oh, we're going to go back to a metalcore roots and stuff like that. Well, you know, you, you start to... Um, disenchant fans after a while like because you want long-term fans and and like you're saying that you went to the to the motley crew Def leopard concert and all like you had such an energy there because those guys always kind of stayed true to their core yeah. and they were able to and they maintain long-term fans both young and old that's what's kind of exciting about that yeah and and so you kind of mentioned this like changing genres with each album and I'm just interested because you mentioned liking pop music when you were younger. Could you ever see yourself trying to write or make a pop album with uh, Corners of Sanctuary? Or well, you, I don't. You, I don't you think, think you would do try it. to stick to your own like genre. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that we would do it Corners of Sanctuary, so to speak. Um, though I wouldn't mind trying my hand at it. If people, you know, oftentimes when you're playing hard rock and metal, people. They, there, there's kind of like this skew line that the people on this side go, I don't want to get involved with these guys because they're, you know, that maybe they're too violent or they're too angry or, you know, for the longest time, oh, we're involved with Satanism or something crazy like that. And then you have the guys on the metal side. It's like, oh, I don't want to be looked at a certain way or, or perceived. And, you know, um, with Corners, we've done, I mean, we're, we're an old school heavy metal style band. So it's a lot of traditional stuff. Um, in terms of the classic metal, but we've tried things like we do Christmas songs every year. Um, and that gives us a, an opportunity to explore some different realms with still staying in a little bit of the hard rock type of stuff. Um, we've done acoustic songs for Christmas. We've done some of the traditional stuff. We've done originals. Some of them have been real heavy. Some of them have been more radio friendly. Um, 
I've been, I've worked on other projects. I mean, I, I would love to try my hand at country music. Um, I'm not a huge country music fan, but those guys are, to me, are so talented and there's a challenge there. I mean, that's like, why wouldn't you, to me, that's a, that could be a great lesson, right? Yeah. And as a songwriter, you want those lessons rather than just say, you know, I'm only going to do this, but you, you, you yeah, can you keep working, keep trying to find yeah. something new to do rather than just, okay, I found this and it works. I'm just going to keep doing this. Right. Right. Again, that could be your, your, your main plate and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, if you want to, if you want to challenge yourself, you want to continue learning. Cause I think this business as in life, I mean, the goal is to keep forward and learn as you go, not to keep tripping over your feet. Yeah. We're going to do that anyways, but let's learn something in the process. And, and this, this band that I am now corners of sanctuary, just how did you come up with that name corners of sanctuary? Sort of, what does it mean? What's that? What's the origin behind that? Uh, yeah. How did you come up with it? Well, for, for us, we look at it like, so the, the formation of the name is like, a corner of sanctuary is a place that we could go at any one of us in our own personal existence uh, where, where it's free of judgment or ridicule and we can be who we want to be without worrying about what other people think, right? Mm -hmm. And in a, in a world so much that, you know, people rush to their keyboards to express their opinion, and a lot of times it's negative, um, everybody feels they have this right to be and then nobody wants to share. You start finding that people stop sharing the real stuff and now it's all fake but a corner of sanctuary is a place you can go and be whoever you want to be or think you want to be or dream to be and not worry about that stuff and for us music is a corner of sanctuary like we, like when we're doing our music when we're playing it when we're writing recording it for us that's one of those perfect circles for us to be mm -hmm. and but we don't want to do it by ourselves so we want to share that corner of sanctuary with somebody else, other people, and we hope they find a bit of peace in that as well. And again, like I said, music is subjective, so it's not going to be for everybody. But for the people that uh, that do like it, there's plenty of room on the boat. Come on in. Are you a music artist trying to find a way to get your music on as many streaming platforms as possible? Then check out DistroKid. DistroKid is a super user-friendly and super easy-to-use service that will make your music available in stores like Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Amazon Music, YouTube, Snapchat, everything. Everything you could imagine, it's available. People will even be able to add your songs into their Instagram stories. DistroKid helps you with the distribution, monetization, and promotion of all of your music. Use the link in the description of this video for 7% off any DistroKid package you want. Pick from musician packages designed to help artists get their own music out there, or even get a label package where you can manage up to 100 artists from one profile. So that's more for like managers, labels, and you can also get the musician package that I mentioned earlier, which is more for artists, producers, things like that. It's super easy, and you can get 7% off any package right now with the link in the description of this video. So once again, if you're looking for a way to get your music on as many streaming platforms as possible, I'm talking any platform you can think of, get DistroKid and get 7% off right now with the link in the description back to the program so once you kind of got the band started and started you know getting enough traction to play live shows what was that first uh live performance with the band like um it was it was for this band it was pretty cool because for for a few of us in the band at the time and it, it had been a number of years since we actually did any live performance we had we had gotten into the, you know, metal had fallen out of favor and, and it kind of went underground and then they, things started changing and stuff. So we, we were spending more time as individual musicians, either recording material or working with other people behind the scenes, that kind of thing. So when the, when the time came, it's like, wow, this is, I mean, it's, it was exciting and nerve wracking all at the same time. Right. Yeah. Because for us too, the industry had changed so much. So some things were, there was just, just a different approach to it. But I'll tell you what, once we got back on stage, all that kind of stuff just disappeared. 
and we kind of like that old habit kind of kicked back in, which was a plus. Um, and we were pretty excited about it. And, you know, that just, and we've been, we haven't, it's like, we're in our 11th year for this band. Uh, last year was our 10 year anniversary. Unfortunately, with all the restrictions, we didn't get to do everything we wanted to do with touring and stuff, but, um, it's 11 years and still running. And, uh, every show is still as exciting as that first show, whether it's a big or small show. That's, that's the way we look at it. You know, Kiss used to say they, that. Every show to them in those early days was like playing at Madison Square Garden. We look at it the same way because without that connectivity to those live shows to the audience, there isn't much for a band to go on. It's like four guys hanging in someone's basement or garage and just playing the yeah. same songs, right? Yeah. So if you're going to play the same songs, let's play them in front of different people every night. Yeah, and people who who sought it out, who want to hear it, who connect with that music in a similar way that you guys do and so i think that just creates a really cool environment absolutely absolutely because after a while um for some of the venues that we go back to we see a lot of familiar faces like a lot of bands do right you get you start getting connected you start getting familiar and sometimes even friendly um off stage with a lot of the of the audience and it's just like it's just a community of people and, you know, you're connecting with them in a way that you may not connect with in, a re in everyday life, right? Because, you know, there's so much, so much going on in people's lives that sometimes there's not enough time for that connectivity. So within that, you know, 40 minutes to an hour or whatever it is, it's like the music just kind of links everybody together. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah. And, and so was there... It might have it might have been the pandemic or anything else, but was there ever anything that made you you know think about maybe taking a break from music or stepping away from uh, either corners of sanctuary or just music in general, just you know uh, setting it down for a bit and maybe trying to think about anything else? Yeah, I actually did that twice. Um, back in back in ninety one, um, we had a development deal uh, with the band with a large label. And we had we had started recording for them and started going through the whole process. And then, unfortunately, as was the case with a lot of other bands in the, that early part of the 90s, uh, we were released from the contract because metal had fallen out of favor greatly. And alternative and grunge became what the money makers were. So nobody wanted to invest anymore. So. We that band, it was like five years of working really hard to get to that point. We had gone from an independent label that we got picked up on, and that label actually got us to the major development deal. And I was we were all bummed. And so I took about a year off. Um, but then I, I started getting the itch again. So and then I got into a progressive metal band called Corporate Mass. And we did that for about 10 years or so. And then around 2002, I, I I decided to take another break because it was working so hard. And I had gotten to a point where realizing that if, if I'm, if I'm rehearsing or playing with a band, that means I'm writing music. If I'm writing music, um, I got to record that music. If I'm recording music, I got to release that music. If we're releasing music, I got to tour that music. Mm -hmm. And then once that runs out, I do it all over again. And it became like this vicious cycle. And I'm like, wow, I've been doing this now nonstop for, like all these years and like since 85 and it's like just wow this is getting to be so i i took a couple of years off um i started just getting into different things um you know created a, a family life and stuff like that and um, which I'm, i don't regret at all which i think was one of the greatest things that i ever did simply because it gave me new perspective so that when i really started feeling the the urge to get back um by that time, the industry had really changed, and I, you know, I had to start understanding the digital process, how to record. You know, I'm an analog guy, big reel to reel tapes, um, so I had to learn that whole thing, and um, I just started getting into other styles, and it gave me this whole new perspective on what it is I wanted to do, and what it is that I didn't want to do at all anymore. Right, so I started eliminating those things. So I figured I was at a point in my life like if if I don't have control of that, what's the point? So yeah. Me, that's the bigger part of success 
like it, maybe you know it's not the fame or the notoriety though nowadays a lot of bands are facebook famous right and i know we're we're one of those bands and it's okay i mean you listen you take it as it comes right because if you're if you're true to it you can parlay it into other good things and make positive things happen not just for you but for everybody else that's involved um but i but once you and once you kind of figure out what it is you don't want you never have to pay attention to it and 10 years after getting this band together with the pandemic i realized that was that was hammered home even more it's like you know what i don't want to waste cuz as you get into the cycle of being in a band and you're working all the time and the business aspect of it, there's things that you wind up dealing with because it's part of the model. It's part of the process. Right. Yeah. And when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, literally with like when it, in the, when the U S shut down, we were in the UK on tour and we got a call saying, Hey, they're shutting down the borders. You guys got to figure out what you're going to do. And we're like, well, we're just going to keep playing until they tell us we can't play anymore. And then they canceled our flight. And then, you know, at the president at the time said, you guys got till Monday to get out. And we're, we're scrambling for a flight. We're trying to figure out, you know. Yeah. So when we got back to the U.S. and pulled into the Philly airport, it was there was not a soul there. It was the craziest thing. They detained us for several hours, you know, to make sure that, you know, we weren't contagious, yeah. carrying some alien contaminant. Um, you know, some weird stuff like that. But um we realized that like everything in a heartbeat was just pulled out from under us. We had nothing. The only thing we had was the music. That was it, just the music that we could do something with. So once we got over the initial shock, like everybody else, we started focusing on, well, instead of focusing on what we don't have, let's focus on what we do have and continue moving forward. And during that time, we realized that there was a host of stuff involved in this business that we don't want to be privy to anymore. We don't, we're not interested. Like it's just too time consuming. It has too much negative connotation to it. And it just brings you down, right? It just kind of wears you out. And you're like, eh. and you wonder why some musicians kind of have hang their head and go, why are we going through this? Because it's all this other baggage that sometimes isn't the bands. It's all the industry's baggage that's thrown on top of you. So again, back to what that level of success is, is if I can eliminate that, to me, that's massive amounts of success and still be able to do what I'm doing and be happy with it. I know that was the long way around. I apologize. No, no, it's all good. That's, that's what this long form content is for. It's for, you know, those longer answers. It's for those stories. Because I think that definitely, you know, shows something about you that you just wanted to keep playing as long as you could. You didn't want to just, you know, kind of accept defeat and have to come back right away to the right. U.S. And so, and so. You know, that kind of, I mean, just wanting to keep playing music, keep want, wanting to keep going or persevere. Did you, have you just kind of instilled that in yourself or is there like anyone that kind of inspired you to have that sort of work ethic, I guess? Um, yeah. Where does that come um, from? You know, I, I think that that drive is something, I mean, I don't, I don't know it's always been there, so to speak. Um, I mean, I'm sure my, my parents instilled a lot of that. Um, some of the people around me that I work with, um, I know there's been some mentors over the years that kind of, you know, reiterate that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it really is in your corner, right? The responsibility to whatever, whatever happens is, is on you, right? If you, you made your bed, now you sleep in it. Like my yeah. grandpa, used to say that to me all the time and so like if you've done something good the rewards come and you're allowed to to embrace that however the flip side is you do something wrong i mean you know you got to pay the piper i mean like you can't expect to do something and not have some kind of you know repercussions about it so that response that sole responsibility for the individual i think is key and that's if you if if you're responsible for what you do responsible for yourself then you're going to take action to make it the best possible outcome like why would i want to and again i realize there are people in the world that do this and i'm not making judgment in any way shape or form but for me why would i want to add stress baggage and and a negative outcome to what it is that i'm trying to i mean i really want to be positive about it. yeah right you know we we look at it that way and we've always conducted ourselves uh business-wise is like 
you know, sure, we want to make out on the deal, but we want you to make out on the deal as well. This way we could keep coming back and we and both of us are happy to work with each other. Nothing like begrudging somebody like, oh my God, I got to work with this guy again. You know what I mean? I mean, I realize there's something good out of it, but man, it just drives me insane. So I rather have it a positive experience and a win-win for everybody. And I know people throw that around today, go well, win, 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 win. But we're on honestly, it's you know, if if it's a win-win and we have to take a little less, well then let's do it. Just, you know, again, like you were saying, just to keep moving forward, I think is the key because every time I move forward, I'm one step closer to whatever it is I want to achieve. But when I achieve it, I find out that there's even more behind that. And that's the kind of, that's the cycle of life. That's, that's what keeps people going. Once you say, oh, I've done it all, or I've done this, I've done that. What's the point? Well, then you've lost that excitement. Then maybe, you, maybe you need to go do something else. Yeah. And, and, and both you, so both you yourself and Corners of Sanctuary have been, have gone through multiple record labels, multiple deals. What sort of do you find like do you find that like some labels do certain things better or worse like I guess how do you find each label being different or having its own like effect or relationship with the band? Uh, well, that's a tough question, and I need to be as as uh, delicate as I can with yeah, it. Yeah, I know it's a I know it's a touchy subject, so feel uh, feel free to you know I, pass on I, a question or whatever. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. In my experience, I find that most record labels, big or small, are they breach contract within the first two months. You yeah. know what I mean? It becomes like a normal thing. I mean, they, they're in breach of contract on their end almost all the time. And what they say they're going to deliver is just some words on a paper. You know, in today's world, it is so much the artist's or band's responsibility to to make things happen. A lot of artists will get signed or they want to get signed because they think that the label is going to do everything. Yeah. Well, that's not the case. In the old days, the labels used to put up all the money, 100%. Right? But what the artist didn't realize is at the end of that, they have to pay all that money back. It's never yeah. free. So you get a lot of artists who you thought were big time because you've seen them on MTV and tours and buying the T-shirts out. By the early 90s, none of them had any money because they were in hock and in debt to the labor labels. And half of them didn't own most of their music. In the new industry, labels aren't putting the money up because they're not developing bands the same way. And they'll just do some distribution. And, and a lot of that is hit or miss. You really got to know what you're getting into. Um, because some have good distribution deals, other ones don't. Because, again, they're paying for them. You have to pay for that yeah. service. And unless there's a giant return, everybody's losing money. So they, they push a lot back on the bands. Like, you got to do your own promo. you got to do your own PR. you got to be doing this. You know, you have to sell the CDs for me. We'll make them, but you got to sell them for me. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times now you're going to find that you got to do your own PR, own media, you're trying to sell the CDs, you're doing this, you're touring, you're putting together your merch. Well, you might as well just do it yourself. Yeah, you might as well be independent. Yeah. Might as well. Oh. yeah, so that's why at the end of the day, you don't owe anybody money or anybody anything. What you make or don't is all on you. So we've done, we've, we, we do a lot of that as well. So a lot of our, a lot of the deals that we've done over the last several years have been non exclusive. So that means that allows us to do things on our own. We we still release independently along with working with some of the some of the more boutique labels. Um like a lot of our our holiday music we'll release on our own independently just so we maintain control of it. Yeah. There's singles that we do. Yeah. So it's just, you know, again, it's it's an artist's market now if you are willing to put the time in. And it's a lot of legwork, man. It's it's constant. Um, to keep up on the social media and the, you know, artists today wear multiple hats. Like yeah. our handlers are ourselves. Now there are still artists that have handlers, but believe it or not, they're they're paying for that. They're paying for a booking agent, a, a manager, a tour person, um, a PR person. All that stuff costs money. But if a band can 
if they if you've been in the business for a bit, you start collecting lists, you start making connections, and you can start doing a lot of this yourself. It saves you money, it saves you time, yeah. and you do it the way you want to do it. Yeah. And and so a big way that independent artists or bands are doing that is with social media, you know, whatever platform or platforms they choose, they promote it, they put up their music there, whatever. Um, how like do you see that social media is definitely something that helps bands? Do you think, you know, there are aspects that could you know, be bettered in or improved to help uh, bands. Like, what's what's your thought about bands or artists trying to use uh, social platforms to grow? Well, I think uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like you have no choice, right? Yeah. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have social media, how do you promote your band? This is a question that we've talked about for several years. Well, okay, so if you have a website, but then where do you put your website? People don't look at buyers anymore, and you, it's hard to call people up. It, venues want to be able to quickly go online, see you, look at numbers. And some of that numbers, the problem is, is the numbers don't actually equate to reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if I'm playing Philadelphia or I'm playing New York, and I got a huge following in Croatia, that that's not helping the New York venue, but they don't even they're not even putting that together. They're just seeing oh they got all these these likes on Facebook or fans or whatever you, they're called now followers. That means we're going to get a lot of people. Well, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, the right the, kinds of fans that that yeah. will spend money that are willing to go out there and see the artist. And so, yeah. right, exactly. They they statistically they they did some numbers last year that they found that. Like social media really does not help sell CDs. And so neither do press releases. They don't help actually sell merch. Live shows do. Yeah. Because people are, it's impulsive in the moment. They're excited. There's alcohol involved in some yeah. place. You know, there's, there's this, there's this electric feeling happening. Social media, basically all it does is it just gives you a bit of awareness. But again, you can easily get lost in it unless you're at it all the time. But really what you're doing is you're just getting this little piece of attention somewhere that's, you know, all this stuff swarming around. So if you yeah. get that piece and you can maintain it, I think that's a plus. You don't need millions and millions of fans, though. That would be great. I mean, who, who you know, um, you could do it with less if you're doing it correctly. And a lot of indie in the trench artists are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they just, they, they latch on to a small group of, of listeners and they basically cater to them and i think that's great so you know if they they're doing some kind of bank thing or spotify thing or you know something like that um yeah. we try to generate people back to our website too which we then will offer free downloads and stuff like that um because again at the end of the day the website's ours and in an instant you can lose your facebook or instagram or twitter yeah. or for whatever reason. So you want to be able to at least have some kind of hub for them to go back. To. And, and I think that's why our artists are artists and fans are doing it, but it's also, you know, more popular with like influencers or online personalities. They're promoting these, you know, clubs or subscription services where it's sort of just an even better way to connect to the uh, personality directly. It's that way, you know, because they, realistically have no control over instagram all these platforms they can just like if those platforms wanted they could just take the page down but this new model that's getting very popular is you know paying a certain fee a month you get you know all this exclusive content you get you know like direct messaging with the artist or band and i think that's really awesome because it's like it's one of the most authentic and direct connections you can make with a like person in the public eye. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, social media has has decreased at six degrees of, of separation type of thing. I mean, um, I've been fortunate enough over the years that I've connected and, and become friendly with a, a number of artists that I followed, you know, back in the 80s that I was, you know, a fan of. And, you know, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to talk with them at, or, you know, in person on the phone. And it's, it's really, it's really, it's a leveler, right? And it, and it just yeah. brings 
people closer. Um, you know, I've met people all over the world through social media, which is an amazing thing because to me that would have been, you know, just to just to call California in the eighties cost you like, you know, like a half a month's rent. So, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Now you can just kind of, you can kind of message somebody or, you know, that the messenger you can like, like what we're doing here on the zoom and stuff like that. And I could, you could talk to people in the UK and in Russia and it's just, that to me is, is still so amazing. And how, like you were saying earlier, how quickly you can get your music out there and start sharing it with people. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by W Energy. W Energy is an energy drink you mix at home from a tub. It helps you focus. It helps you concentrate. It helps you win. W is a lot like these other energy drink mix companies you see, but it's better. They have better flavors. They have better taste. They have better products. You can get Dragonade, you can get Galaxy Grenade, you can get Dub Sludge, and so many more great flavors like Beach and Peach. Once you have the powder to make one of these flavors, you can also get one of W's own shaker cups to make your drinks at home. If energy drinks aren't your thing, no worries. You can get products like stickers and clothing that look awesome. If you just want to try out W, you can go ahead and get one of their starter packs. It comes with a shaker cup and three flavors. On top of that, any products you get on any order from W, you can save 10% by using my discount code HEROIC. That's just my name, HEROIC, in all caps. One more time, that's code HEROIC at W.GG for 10% off any order. Go focus, go concentrate, go in, be better. When you're coming up with, you know, a new song, when you get in the studio and you're working on a song, you know, maybe for an album or maybe as a single, what does that process sort of look like? Where do most of your songs with the band uh, start from? Um, we're definitely a guitar driven band. So a lot of I would say, you know, most of it starts within the riffing process. And then everything's kind of built around that. And then demos are, are presented to the band and everybody kind of puts their own little stamp on it, right? That's, and I think that's what makes it unique to the band is what makes it specifically Corners of Sanctuary because everybody's stamp is put on it, right? So a yeah. little, like a layout's done, you know, like, a, like an arrangement's done, but you're not going to have that certain sound unless James is playing bass or, you know, Matt T's doing his drum stuff. So I think that that's, that's what's kind of cool about that. And that's what gives all bands and artists, I think, their signature sound or their style or whatever it is, because it's that, it's that individual stamp that's put on. Um, and then it just, you know, we, we may practice it a bit, rehearse it a bit, then we take it to the studio. And, and sometimes we find the song changes when it gets into the studio because... Yeah. Now you're now you're listening to it and observing it almost as a as a third party because now it's up on the speakers and you're and you're you're hearing it differently and you start envisioning things and you're like oh well maybe we could do this and maybe we could do that and and the beauty with with the digital age now is that all that is anything you think of all that plus is possible back in the analog days. There were limitations. There were limitations to how much you can do, uh, what the tape could do, how much you could handle. Because after a while, that stuff would start stretching, and you know. Yeah. So, you know, and then we we have found that the music changes multiple times. You know, from the the initial writing of it to the rehearsing of it to the recording of it. To once you start playing it live, and that there's like you know four or five permeations of the song, then the longer you play it live, the more the song starts to evolve. And we just, over the summer, we released our second best of uh, compilation called Metal Never Died. Yeah. A handful of the songs were re-recorded, like from, you know, 10, 11 years ago and in between. And we found that, hey, we're playing them differently than we originally recorded them. Or we're doing something that we didn't do before and it's really cool and so we wanted to bring some of them songs up to speed of how we were doing it today and you learn so much about about yourself it's it's like you can actually not, for a lack of a better not see but you can you can hear the maturation of the band yeah of course of the 10 11 years and uh i do rem i remember i remember an interview one time with um pat benatar and she was saying that 
it's it's almost by design that there's different versions of the song. There's the, yeah. the studio song, there's the live version, and sometimes the song is played differently every night depending on the energy of the show or where they're at or what they're trying to achieve. I mean, they may be doing the same chords in the same order, but they may be hitting something a little bit more at one time or it's a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. The drummer just throws in a little bit of something else. And that just just creates this whole new thing. And and that's kind of the exciting thing about writing music because it it constantly evolves. And I call it it's like the magic of music. It's like mm -hmm. it's like it's like movie production, you know what I mean? It's kind of exciting. Yeah. 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 And and it's sort of it's sort of like those movie a lot like um sort of what a like Marvel's trying to do in their movies. It's like it keeps expanding, keeps growing. And it, you know, it, there are so many new things added, so many variations that, you know, there's always going to be some new version of the song or some thing you didn't hear before in the song that you can kind of latch on to and really like. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like if you've been a band that's been around a long, long time, you may have changed members. And every time you change a member, add a member or whatever, it, things change a little bit. It's still mm -hmm. So if you if you listen to a lot of bands that are kind of either reemerging or kind of been hanging on since like say the eighties and they're out there now. I mean, there's several bands out there like Quiet Riot. I mean, there's not one original member; it's somebody else. Yeah. Look, still flocking to see them, but the songs really are not the same song. They're different songs, you know. Foreigner, you know. I mean, there's there's a whole collection of new guys, and you know, you have two great whites out there, and. Yeah. You know, just all this stuff. I mean, you have, you know, you have Queensryche doing their songs and then you have Jeff Tate doing songs that he did with Queensryche and they both sound different, but they sound similar and they sound, yeah. you know, there's all these different, you know, then you have tribute bands and cover acts that are doing, I mean, even like, you, you know, you just seen Def Leppard. Def Leppard doesn't sound like the Def Leppard from 86 or 83 or 88, you know, and they're a whole new, you know, and they have, there's, not that they're new guitar players, but they're not, yeah. neither of them are the original guitar players. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but they've been there long enough. Actually, they, the, both of them have been there longer than any of the original guitar players, you know? Mm. So it's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing, but you know, like Vivian Campbell still looked at as the new guy, even though he's been there since, I don't know, 91 or something. Yeah. 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 However long. You know? Yeah. And, and so when you're sort of coming up with music, is there, you know, do you find inspiration from any other bands, other artists? And if you do, how do you sort of, you know, balance inspiration with imitation? How do you make sure it doesn't sound too much like another band and kind of sound like you're copying almost? That that's a great question, actually. Uh, well, listen, a lot of a lot of the classic metal bands like Judas Priest, Early Accept, Sabotage, um, you know, here on the on, in America. Um, you know, you have Kiss and and Queensryche and, you know, Rat and stuff like that. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of that inspiration, like that that music still still does something for me, right? And mm. it could be because it's the music of your youth. You know, most people make their musical connections prior to 30. And, and it's that stuff that sticks with you. However, it resonates with you as a teenager because of the angst, because of the, you know, uh, as you're going through, you know, adolescence and things like that. Um, so we don't make the same connections to music after, after 30. It doesn't mean that we can't and can't mm -hmm. change styles, but we also start looking at music differently and things that we may have not liked pre 20, we may start liking post 30. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It just, it's just, again, it's just the way we evolve as, as beings, individuals. Um, but that's a good question. How do you how do you balance the the two? And really, I think what it is is for us, it's just taking those influences and all those like if we took all the bands that we like, we piled them up. Well, whatever that sounds like to us, that's that's kind of what we're pulling out from it. Yeah. So yeah, I I hear this and I hear this and. Like we've been compared to a lot. I mean, we've been compared to ZZ Top and Sammy Hagar, ACDC, um, Judas Priest, except Man of War, 
I mean, it, even bands that we've never even really listened to, they weren't yeah. really our, our wheelhouse of, of, of picks. So yeah. speak. But it's a matter of how people's listening relates to what they're hearing, what mm-hmm. is familiar to them. And that, and the way I look at it is I don't care who they, I mean, listen, if you compare us to anybody, I don't, somebody could say, Hey, you guys sound like Lady, Ga- Lady Gaga. That's okay. Yeah. Whatever. It's all, pl- I'm in good company. Yeah. You know, if you guys, if somebody says, man, you guys sound like, a, you know, like, like, like you're at a dump during the heat wave. I'm like, well, I don't know about that. But I guess maybe somebody would like that too. Who knows? Yeah. But I, yeah. That, I think having such a, um, an eclectic background of interests that in, unless you're working in a tribute band where you're trying to really for lack of a better word, regurgitate that sound and yeah. style. Um, I think that it's not going to, it doesn't happen unless you're really trying to do it. That's my opinion. And and I don't think it's always a bad thing like you're saying to get compared to other artists. Um, a while back, a couple months ago on, on this podcast, I was talking to this uh, group, the astronomers, and they were saying, yeah, you know, a lot of, they're kind of more of a pop band, but they were saying, um, you know, a lot of people compare us to AJR and they were like, great, you're comparing us to one of the largest bands in the world right now. Like, oh, no, that's so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, there are. And that's funny you say that because there are people that get offended. Like, like I know, like somebody like ACDC, like, oh, listen, ACDC, it's, it's um, they're, the Back in Black album, what, 53 million copies and it's still selling. I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, that's OK with me. But there are people that get like slightly offended because it's like, well, that's not what they're trying to achieve. But yeah, but you're in good company. You're in yeah. company. That to me, that's that's amazing because yeah. again, for that listener, that's what they're connecting to. That's what they're hearing, and that's okay because that's why musical tastes run the gambit because we're each picking something different than the other person. Like, if you like ACDC, I like ACDC. There may be things that we share that of why we like them but then there's things that we probably wouldn't share because i'm hearing something different than you you may like this and i like this instead but you know it doesn't yeah. matter nah yeah and, and so um you know back in june i think you cor- corners of sanctuary played at sonar fest right yeah yes. right and so what what was that sort of like or how do you find festival shows comparing to like shows that for you like specific to the band well I, I well one usually with the festival type shows there's a a larger collection of different kinds of music now mm-hmm. not not it again it is genre specific of course yeah. it's not math uh, rap and metal and country yeah. so i've been on shows like that and they're very those they're kind of cool because the artists are like, everybody's kind of like supportive, but it's like, you got a weird audience. Yeah. You'll see it packed and then you'll see people disappear and then it's packed again, you know, like that. But when you have this different uh, collection of hard rock, heavy metal, you know, aggressive type music, you're getting fan, you're getting the opportunity to, to present your music, whatever it is to a whole new group of people that probably, either haven't heard you weren't aware of you and it's you know it's 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 putting you on you know you get you get a chance to sell it and you you oftentimes you make new connections and that's kind of exciting i mean there's always an energy you know bands but there's also craziness that's going on too because the promoters and everybody's trying to keep it running on time so they're like you know it's yeah. chop 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 but there is kind of an excitement about that because you're meeting new people that people that normally wouldn't go to your show specifically, but they're there because some other bands are there and, you know, you're in the lineup and somebody would go, Hey, you know, I never heard you guys before. I'm looking forward to it. Or, Hey, I yeah. wasn't aware of you guys. This is amazing. Can I get a CD? Something like that. And you, so you've done your job. I mean, that's yeah. kind of what it is, right? We're, we're, we're bringing our corner of sanctuary to other people so they could share that space with us. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's awesome, especially you know going back to the whole meaning of the band name you brought up in that people people are finding those corners of sanctuary with the band. Yeah. Um, for once you like release 
music. You have um, music out now. Is there any, you know, song of yours or maybe an album that, you know, performed better or worse than you initially thought that kind of defied your expectations once it was out there? Yeah, well, actually, so this this year um, we released our very first cover song. Yeah. And it's funny because you said Defy. Yeah. We have an EP that we did a we did a three song uh, tribute EP to the, uh, Def Leppard, and we called it Defying. Mm-hmm. One, we wanted to play on the Def Leppard name, but then we also wanted to kind of relay our sentiment towards doing cover songs. We didn't get into this to do other people's music, so we we've been hesitant and always pushed it off for a lot of years. Um, again, over the pandemic we started to learn different things and said, Hey, maybe we should do this and that. And uh, it, you know, we said, you know, after a while, let's give it a shot. And um, we actually did one song last year, but we sat on it for six months. Cause we were like, I don't know if we should. Yeah. It. We're an original band. I mean, you know, yeah. and doing a Def Leppard song may not necessarily click with everybody, but we, we put, we wound up putting it out there after six months and the, the feedback was great. So we decided to do two more and we released the EP. We did a three song EP. We released it in June and we released the second single, Bring It On The Heartbreak. Mm. And it's just, it's going ballistic. It's going crazy. And we didn't expect it. We just figured we're going to put it out there because we have our compilation CD coming out, which we released like not even four weeks later. Yeah. You know, Because again, it's all our music. Mm. And bringing on the heartbreak has just been kind of the the numbers have been going out that like like for us right now we got it like a bona fide hit. It's unfortunate it's somebody else's song, but hey, listen, yeah. we can never take it as we can get it, right? Yeah, learn something. If you can't beat them, cover them. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that one before, but I like it definitely. <laughs> well, the other one we use is if you can't beat them, open for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so you know. Actually, you know, funny enough, kind of relating to that, you know, opening collaboration uh, theme, if you sort of a hypothetical question I like to ask, if you sort of got this magical opportunity to make a song with any band, any artist in the world, who who would you pick for Corners of Sanctuary to work with? Well, I, I think for us, it would definitely be Judas Priest, hands down, because that is, for me, that's a role model band. Who they've longevity in the heavy metal world in the ups and downs, you know, have tried different permutations of it. I think that's you know that would be to me that would be stellar. Yeah, yeah, that, that would that would validate pretty much everything. I could probably retire after that one. Yeah, and and I guess also just do you have any live show in mind that's sort of your favorite? That kind of you know sticks in your memory like uh because of how great it was any one specific show that you really like to play that we that we've already played yeah 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 um a couple of years back uh we we opened direct open we were the only other band that opened for udo who was the original singer of accept and he came he was coming through philly played at the trocadero theater which is now closed unfortunately Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a call on, he was coming Saturday. We got a call on Wednesday and said, would you guys, uh, you know, open for Udo? I don't even think they got it out. They said, yes. I didn't even talk to the band. I just said, yes, we're doing it. And he says, all right, um, I have to get all the work. I'll let you know by Friday. So by Friday at, at one thirty, two o'clock, we got the word that you guys got the show. Um, we need, you know, all this kind of stuff. So. I called the band and I says, listen, I don't care what you're doing tomorrow. We're <laughs> open for Udo. That's the end of it. So we call it, that's our Cinderella story. We got down there. We were actually treated like we were, we were stars. It was just amazing. But by 11 o'clock, we were back to, you know, the pumpkin had, had disappeared. Yeah. And, they the door and I wound up getting a ticket that night in Philly. So for parking, you know, cause it's a nightmare, but it was an amazing show. One, to be both a performer and a fan yeah. it was because he, he, he sounded great. The music was intense. The place was packed. You're playing in your hometown uh, to one of, with one of your heroes. And 
it was just, you know, we, we opened up on a, it was a dark stage. So we were in complete black. The guy introduced us, the lights kick on, we kicked right in. We were, it was literally, cause we weren't sure. We didn't know how packed the place was until them lights went on. And we yeah. were like, oh my God, here, you know, but it was, it was an amazing show. We had such a great time. I think there's actually some footage of it on YouTube somewhere, but that's the show. We've done tons of shows. We've opened for Striper to a packed yeah. house. We've, we played in festivals over in Germany. Um, we we played the Whiskey A Go Go with the Iron Maidens to a packed out, sold out house, and that's an amazing. That was amazing too. But I think to play in your hometown to one of your heroes, yeah. just was it is unbeatable. Like I said, we called our Cinderella story. Yeah, and, and and so that was sort of you know a show you've already done, already played that you really like. Do you have any, you know, dream shows, dream venues that you would want to play that you haven't gotten the chance to yet? Yeah, like, I mean, well, sure. I, I would love to play Madison Square Garden with Judas Priest. That'd be amazing. Or yeah. even, actually, I don't think Judas Priest is allowed back in Madison Square Garden anymore. But I'll play with Kiss. I, mm-hmm. I, I'll play anywhere with anybody, actually. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man. It just, it just. The opportunity to play big or small is is always um, it's it's a great especially if they call you yeah so that would be great um, if I had like if it if I could go back in the time and it was like you know I, I could I had a genie in a bottle I would love to play the Philadelphia Spectrum back in the day mm-hmm. the Spectrum's no longer there they were down but it was yeah. such an iconic place so many bands came through that it just would have been. To me, that would have been the ultimate. Yeah, and, and so uh, you know, with with your time as corners of sanctuary, have you had any memorable fan interactions, fan meetings, maybe like after a show or something? Just any sort of interaction that really stuck with you from a fan? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's been numbers of them. Um, like we're very fortunate that that. We we make ourselves, especially at the shows, we make ourselves accessible to anybody yeah. that we want, right? We don't charge for pictures. We don't charge for autographs. We don't, you know, we're happy to, you know, to get behind a picture and all that with people. I mean, yeah. you have to have that interaction. I think that that's that, that human quality, right? Yeah. I'm not saying get super personal, give them a bank account, 100 bucks, and, you know, take them out to eat. But I'm just saying yeah. it, it really is... A, the time they've come to see you they're given their, their time you give and we've just talked about how like you know how people have like how they've connected to the music or this one yeah. this one gentleman one time said to us like he had gotten sick had a stroke and he used our music at the time to help get through that and we were all like kind of floored like are you sure you're, you're talking to the right band I mean, like, <laughs> You know what I mean? And it was just, it was kind of moving in a way. Like, yeah, we had this feeling like, wow, man. I mean, like, you know, I mean, like we take what we do seriously, but we don't, we, but we, we kind of joke around a lot too. Cause at the yeah. end of the day, well, it's just us. Yeah. Uh, I don't know like you know, but somebody once told me that it's very hard for an artist or a band to look at themselves the same way that a fan or a listener, the yeah. audience, because yeah. there's something different. You may you may be the biggest geek in town right here, um, but at the same time, they're not seeing you that way. Yeah, they they, they um, uh, relate you to the music that they hear, and then the emotions that come to that. So it's a very sacred um, relationship, even though it's real. It could be real short, real you know, um, and you have to honor that. You can't be disrespectful. I've seen too many artists be disrespectful, just people in general. Yeah. And it's just not cool, man. Yeah. And that, all that's going to do is make whoever wanted to meet you no longer want to meet you and, you know, fall out of maybe their fandom of you. And Right. Exactly. And and so is there a song of yours, either one that you've just had a hand in or a song by Corners of Sanctuary that's your own favorite, your personal favorite? Um, I, I, I think... Well, there's, for me, I mean, like we, we have a, we have a couple songs in the set that we've been playing for a number of years that the crowd definitely connects to. And 
which makes it even more enjoyable to play. Mm -hmm. Like the hunt's a big one if it's a crowd favorite because the crowd gets to participate in singing on the hunt. Um, but I think for me, we 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 do a, the show closers Heliquin, and I enjoy playing that song. I mean, it's got an old school vibe. It's it's a very punchy. It just keeps moving. Yeah, it keeps driving, and I enjoy doing the lead in it. And it just really, I think that's the song that I I really at out of all the songs we do, and there's a lot of them that that i enjoy but there's something about that song that i it never gets old to play yeah 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 and and so you know now moving forward you've announced that you have an upcoming album vengeance of the fallen is you know first of all is there a release date on that yet and second what can we sort of expect from this new project what sort of can people look forward to with this new album we don't have a release date, but I, I think it's going to be later in 2023 because we're actually also working on a uh, an EP right now called This Is Metal, which will be coming out. Actually, it's going to come out as a UK exclusive first CD mm -hmm. um, and then uh, release later in the spring everywhere else. Yeah. So I think we'll be focusing on that. At, and then, but for Vengeance of the Fallen, I think we're going to, the goal at the time was is we were going to speed some things up a little bit and get like we were going I think we were at the writing was going more towards old school power metal but we had made a small detour with uh blood and steel last year where we got a little darker a little grittier still stayed true to our core but we yeah. just approached it because I think you know we it was written during the COVID time. So there was a lot of maybe underlying anger that most of us were feeling. And it was, it was a general feeling everywhere. So that yeah. album kind of reflected some of that, but this one's going to be maybe a little bit more it, um, upbeat. Like we have most of the album together. It's, it's just getting the time to, to finish it up and then getting to the mixing mastering. And then with some other things going on and we've gotten back into playing live too. So we're trying to, you know, get it caught up for lost time. And we may be going to the UK early next year. Yeah. So finish that tour that we started two years ago. So we're probably looking at later in the fall that that album will come out. I mean, yeah, I think we're going to like it. It's going to be Corners of Sanctuary. There's no two ways about it. But maybe maybe something a little bit uh, surprising. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely look forward to that. That was all I had for you today. Thank you so much for coming on where can people find you or the band online websites social platforms wherever uh you, you can go right to our website our official website at www.cornersofsanctuary.com but we're on facebook twitter instagram linkedin and a bunch of other stuff i don't know you just do a google search corners of sanctuary tons of stuff will come up even some free downloads on some sites that i'm not aware of but uh i can't guarantee the quality of those downloads but if you're going to if you're going to rip us off buy something first then at least you get good quality music yeah yeah well thank you again so much for coming on and it's been a great talk and i can't wait to hear vengeance of the fallen once it comes out thanks so much man i appreciate you having me on thanks for all the support yeah thank you all right See all right you. take it easy <laughs>